Hi there. If you're watching this, you may be considering converting to Islam, and it may seem like a good idea to you at the moment. After all, you've probably been told that the word Islam means submission, and that this simply refers to submission to God. If you believe in God, why wouldn't you want to submit to Him? Makes sense, right? Not so fast. There are two main reasons you should slow down and think about this a bit more carefully. First, according to the Quran, you can only submit to Allah by fully submitting to all of the decisions of Muhammad. In chapter 4, verse 65 of the Quran, Allah declares, But know, by your Lord, they can have no faith until they make you, O Muhammad, judge in all disputes between them, and find in themselves no resistance against your decisions, and accept them with full submission. Notice, you can have no real Islamic faith until you make Muhammad judge in all disputes, and you find no resistance in yourself against any of his decisions. You have to accept Muhammad's decisions with full submission. So, while the word Islam does mean submission, it's really the religion of submission to a man, because according to the Quran, you can only submit to Allah by submitting to Muhammad. Who was Muhammad? He was an illiterate 7th century Arabian caravan robber and warlord. As a rule, before you unquestioningly accept all of the teachings of an illiterate 7th century Arabian caravan robber and warlord, you should really really make sure you can trust him as a prophet. And that requires carefully examining his life and teachings, along with the so-called evidences of his prophethood. The second reason you should proceed with caution here is that Muhammad ordered his followers to execute anyone who leaves Islam. For instance, in Sunan An-Nasai 4067, we read, The Messenger of Allah said, Whoever changes his religion kill him. So, if you convert to Islam without doing any careful research, and you later decide to leave Islam, you'll be under a death sentence for the rest of your life. Islamic preachers will send you threats, warning you that, once they're in power, you'll be executed. This is a part of our religion, there's a reason to it. Yeah, there's a reason why there's a capital punishment, because people like you, little weaklings who leave their religion and cause uh, corruption in the land by spreading it, the capital punishment in Islamic law would be applied to you. We have no doubt. And we're proud of that. Yeah, capital punishment will be applied in an Islamic state. Yeah. Converting to Islam isn't like joining a club that you can simply leave once you change your mind. It's something that follows you forever through threats of violence. If you're going to convert to a religion that will sentence you to death for changing your mind, here again, you should make sure you understand what you're getting into and why you're getting into it. So, why are you considering converting to Islam? Do you have a Muslim friend who's trying to convince you to convert? Has someone been sending you videos filled with amazing proofs that Islam is true? Did you bother to carefully examine these proofs that were presented to you? Did you look up the references? Did you research responses to these arguments? No, you didn't. Because if you had carefully examined the arguments for Islam, we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. You wouldn't be thinking about converting. What would you find if you took a closer look at any of these arguments for Islam. Muslim preachers and apologists claim that the Quran is filled with amazing scientific insights that couldn't possibly have been known in the 7th century. Do yourself a favor. Look up the verses and see what they actually say. They never say what the Muslim preachers and apologists claim they say. Islamic preachers take extremely vague verses that aren't saying anything scientific, and they insert modern science into these extremely vague verses and claim that the verses are making scientific claims. The reason they have to go to vague verses is that all of the clear scientific claims in the Quran are completely wrong. For instance, the Quran claims very clearly that the sun sets in a muddy pool. 
In a passage about the travels of someone named Dhul Karnain, usually thought to be Alexander the Great, we read in verses 85 to 86 of chapter 18, So he followed away, until, when he reached the setting place of the sun, he found it setting in a spring of black, muddy, or hot water, and he found near it a people. The Quran claims that the sun sets in a muddy pool, which means that the sun is much smaller than the earth, and that there are people who live there. If you ask your Muslim friends about this, they'll tell you that you have to reinterpret the passage. They'll say that the Quran is only claiming that Dhul-Karnain saw a reflection in a pool of water and that it appeared to him as if the sun were setting in that pool. The problem with this reinterpretation is that Muhammad himself claimed that the sun sets in a pool of water. Sunan Abu Dawud, 4002. It was narrated that Abu Dar said, I was riding behind the Messenger of Allah while he was on a donkey, and the sun was setting. He said, Do you know where this sun sets? I said, Allah and his Messenger know best. He said, it sets in a spring of warm water. There's nothing about Dhul Karnain here, so this can't be referring to something Dhul Karnain saw. This is Muhammad telling his companions what happens to the sun when it sets. Like Allah in the Quran, Muhammad claims that the sun sets in a pool of water. You'll find these kinds of things all over the Quran. The Quran claims that semen is formed between the backbone and the ribs, that the earth is flat, that there are seven earths, that the sun orbits the earth, that human embryos are blood clots, that the sky would fall on the earth if Allah didn't hold it up, and that stars are missiles that Allah uses to shoot demons who try to sneak into heaven. Did your Muslim friend bother telling you any of this? Here again, if you bring up these verses to a Muslim preacher, he'll tell you that you have to reinterpret them. Notice, you have to reinterpret all of the clear scientific claims of the Quran because they're all wrong. Then you have to insert modern science into hopelessly vague verses in order to get the scientific miracle. Is this a good reason to submit to all of the decisions of an illiterate 7th century Arabian caravan robber and warlord? Perhaps you've been told about the miraculous preservation of the Quran. There's only one Quran, perfectly preserved right down to the letter from the time of Muhammad. Let me guess, whoever told you about the miraculous preservation of the Quran didn't bother telling you that, according to Muslim sources, entire chapters of the Quran were lost because Muhammad's companions were too lazy to recite them. He didn't bother telling you that hundreds of verses were lost because the only people who had them memorized died in battle. He didn't bother telling you that verses were eaten by a sheep. He definitely didn't show you Sunan Ibn Majah, 1944. It was narrated that Aisha said, the verse of stoning and of breastfeeding an adult ten times was revealed, and the paper was with me under my pillow. When the Messenger of Allah died, we were preoccupied with his death, and a tame sheep came in and ate it. Those verses were part of the Quran. They're not in the Quran today. What happened to them? Muhammad's wife Aisha had the only copy, and a sheep ate it. So Allah couldn't protect the Quran from a sheep. According to Muslim sources, Uthman III of the rightly guided caliphs had to burn countless copies of the Quran to cover up all the differences. And even that didn't work because there are still different versions of the Quran even today. Muslim scholars are now being forced to admit that there are different versions of the Quran. And today, most Muslims read the Quran in a text uh, that uh, is referred to as the Egyptian edition uh, of 1924. Uh, but this is not the only text of the Quran that is read uh, throughout the world. In other words, if you were to compare two printed Qurans, 
you're going to see differences between them. And this is something that many people are unaware of and many people have heard but are not fully familiar with, especially those who have been exposed to uh, some of our brothers who live in Algeria or Morocco or other North African countries. They recite the Qur'an in a slightly different way. Not just a voice or not just a, a, a speaking style, but also changes in letters and, and, and words and uh, harakat. And it's very clear to you and to every single very advanced student and specialist that the standard narrative has holes in it. That's what I'm going to say. On what planet is this a good reason to make an illiterate 7th century Arabian caravan robber and warlord the ultimate authority on everything you think or do? Perhaps your Muslim friend told you that Muhammad was a champion of women's rights. But he forgot to mention that Muhammad had sex with a prepubescent 9-year-old girl named Aisha. He forgot to tell you that Muhammad had sex with his slave girls. He forgot to tell you that Muhammad allowed his followers to beat their wives into submission and to rape their female captives and to hire prostitutes. Perhaps your Muslim friend told you that Islam must be true because it's spreading so rapidly. I have no idea why something growing rapidly would mean that it's true, but I bet your friend didn't tell you why Islam is growing so rapidly. The same Pew Research study that said that Islam is the world's fastest growing religion also said that the primary reason for Islam's rapid growth is high birth rates. Why do Muslims have higher birth rates than other groups? It's because of the impact Islam has on women and girls. In many parts of the Muslim world, educating girls is frowned upon. Women having careers is frowned upon. So girls are married off at a young age and turned into baby-making machines. By the time a young woman in America has her first child when she's 25 years old, a young woman in Yemen is having her sixth child because she was married off when she was 11 or 12 years old. So are we supposed to conclude that Islam is true because it gives women and girls nothing to do apart from making babies? Notice, Every single reason you've been given to believe in Islam falls apart as soon as you take a closer look. Why, in the name of common sense, would you convert to a religion that requires you to submit yourself completely to the teachings of an illiterate 7th century Arabian caravan robber and warlord, and that will sentence you to death if you ever change your mind, when the only reasons to accept the religion evaporate the moment you investigate them? In case you'd like to carefully examine Muhammad and the Quran before converting, I've included in the description box some links to articles and videos on all of the issues I brought up in this video. But maybe you'd like a second opinion. Maybe you'd like to hear from someone who was once a Muslim and had to learn all of this the hard way. The death threat from a Muslim preacher earlier in this video was a message to a young man who now calls himself the apostate prophet. He's an ex-Muslim who's under a death sentence for leaving Islam after realizing that it's false. Don't leave without clicking on his video and letting this former Muslim explain why you should think twice about converting to Islam.